Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, we recently did a podcast on what the most popular ISO standards were across the globe. And ISO 9001 was top of the charts. So I thought I'd spend a bit of time with you just taking you through what ISO 9001 actually is. But before we do that, I'd like to go back to our ISO show roots and to bust some myths about what ISO 9001 isn't, because I think Unfortunately, there's a lot of misconceptions about 9001. A number of these issues are related to legacy thoughts and opinions on the old BS5750, which was 9001's predecessor. This was a standard that was introduced in the late 70s, and it was published and introduced in the early 80s. Now, businesses have evolved so much since the early 80s. And as a result, the standards have as well. But unfortunately, some people still think it's the old standard. Well, it's not. There have been several revisions since then. So some of the other myths around ISO 9001 is that you have to have a quality manual. Well, no, you don't. You have to have a quality manager within your organisation. No, you don't. You need to have lots of documented procedures. And it's like wearing a straight jacket. No, you don't. So now that I've got that off my chest, a few of those myths have been busted. Let's look at what 9001 actually is. So ISO 9001 provides a common framework for things all businesses should have in place, like business objectives, understanding your risks and your opportunities, defining your ways of working as an organisation. So who does what? When? How do you deliver your products and services? Where is your central repository for your company documents, forms and templates? So ISO 9001 provides a common framework, a quality management system that is your go-to place as a business. So it's ultimately your blueprint for your business operations, if implemented in the right way. I thought it'd be helpful just to walk through the standard itself and explain what's included. I'm not going to go through every single subclause because otherwise you'll be falling asleep before long. (laughs) Uh, But what I will do is pick out some of the juicy bits where I think it adds most value and also where the biggest gaps are in most businesses when it comes to having a quality system in place. So I'm going to highlight those key areas and just basically talk you through step by step the clauses within the standard. So I've actually got a copy of ISO 9001 2015 in front of me. This is a document that you can purchase online. The BSI Standards Shop is a good place to go to. So that is for sale across the globe from different standards bodies. The document itself is 28 pages, but it's only 18 pages that cover the requirements of ISO 9001 that's actually auditable that you can actually implement. So it has 10 clauses within the standard, but you'll only actually be audited against clauses 4 to 10. So basically there are seven key requirements within the standard. So I'm just going to take you through that. And those seven requirements are context of the organisation, leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation and improvement. So the plan is that I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on each of those seven areas just to give you an overview really of what's included within the standard. Now before we delve into those seven clauses I'd just like to kind of just explain a bit about the couple of pages that kind of lead into the requirements. So in the intro it does provide a bit of guidance on the terminology within the standard. The top tip here, and it has been mentioned in other podcasts that we've done, is where the term shall is referenced within the standard, it indicates a requirement, you've got to do it. (laughs) There's no getting out of it. If there's a shall, you've got to do it. 
The standard does have other verbal forms such as should, may and can and obviously that's quite self-explanatory. So should, yep, that does indicate a recommendation. May it indicates a permission and can indicates a possibility or a capability. So in this podcast, I will reference shall on a couple of occasions, and that's because you've got to have certain things in place in order to be able to achieve certification to this standard. And within the introduction to the standard, it addresses the fact that businesses need to continually improve if they're going to survive and also to meet clients' requirements. Because let's face it, we all work in an ever-changing and challenging environment So going back to that plan, do, check, act model of continual improvement is something that's kind of throughout the standard. So I thought that was worth identifying. Also, the fact that it takes a risk-based approach now compared to previous versions of ISO 9001. It enables an organisation to understand the influencing factors that a business could face. So you have to identify those and make sure that you're well prepared as an organisation, which of course just makes business sense, doesn't it? So starting off with the standard then, sections one, two and three, you can ignore them. I won't go into that, it just references terms and definitions and normative references, it's a bit boring. So let's start with the juicy part, section four. So this is the auditable part of the standard and where that begins. And this is called context of the organisation. What does that actually mean? Well, It means understanding the organisation, your organisation, and the environment in which it operates. So it's about understanding the risks and opportunities that your organisation faces. And you also need to understand the needs and expectations of your interested parties. So what do your staff need? Well, at a very basic level, they need contracts of employment, They need a safe working environment. What are our clients' needs? What are other stakeholders' needs? What are our contractors' needs? Regulators, such as the HSE, what are their needs? And how do we meet those requirements? So there are a number of different needs that we have to meet to keep our interested parties happy and to stay legally compliant. So this first part kind of addresses that and looks at our organisation and finds out Who do we need to keep happy and how are we going to do that? The next stage is to look at determining the scope of your quality management system. So some organisations like to have the entire company included within the scope of certification. But as we've covered on previous podcasts, you can actually reduce the scope if you want to. So if it's a large organisation and you've got several locations, lots of different services... It may be too much to implement ISO 9001 in one go. So what you can do is just reduce the scope so it's covering certain locations and services, get certified for that, and then you can expand it over the three-year period that you're certified for. So it's down to you, at the end of the day, what you include within your scope of certification. It's also worth mentioning that you can make certain exclusions from the standard itself. Now, typically, this is in a section around operations, and quite often it could be linked to calibration of equipment. So if you can justify that you don't need to calibrate equipment, you can exclude that. But on the whole, about 95% of the standard, it will be applicable, and you will include that within your quality management system. So what is a quality management system? Well, in the next section, it actually identifies what should be included within that quality management system. And it says that the organisation shall, no, shall, (laughs) establish, implement, maintain and continually improve a quality management system, including the processes needed and their interactions in accordance with requirements of this international standard and your business ultimately. So what this means is you need to capture what processes your business needs to operate. And you also need to determine what your client's needs are. So how do you deal with a new inquiry, for example? That's a good starting point, developing that quality management system. 
Okay, so that's section four. Section five is leadership. If you've listened to some of our previous ISO show interviews with people that have been through this process with not just 9001, but other standards, you'll have heard the importance of leadership commitment. And I think it's fair to say that if you haven't got leadership commitment, you can forget it because realistically, it's not going to be very successful. <laughs> so it is really important to get that leadership commitment. And the standard takes you through step by step on what's kind of expected from your leadership team. So things like taking accountability, having a quality policy and having objectives for the business. Ensuring that leadership have got the right resources in place in order to be able to deliver the services and meet your interested parties' requirements. And also to communicate the importance of your processes and your systems and why it's important to comply with those procedures. Also, they have a responsibility to engage, direct and support all of those that are responsible for the delivery of the quality management system. And finally, they have a commitment to promote improvement. To me, that's just a no-brainer, isn't it, really? So they need to be at the forefront of this. They need to really be driving continual improvement within the organisation. The next section under leadership is customer focus. So you need to understand what the customer's needs are and also any applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. So you need to determine what they are, understand them and have a system in place to meet those requirements. And there's a very strong emphasis on enhancing customer satisfaction. So not just meeting customer requirements, but enhancing customer satisfaction. So at the end of the day, you're going to have a system that hopefully isn't just going to keep existing clients as loyal clients, but also to win new business because the news will spread about the products and services that you're providing. Section 5.2 is policy. So all organisations should have a quality policy. Now, this doesn't have to be a lengthy document. It's typically on one side of A4. And the standard does explain the types of things that you should be referencing within that quality policy. One of those things, as an example, is to include a commitment to continual improvement. You also need to communicate the quality policy. So the standard stipulates that the quality policy shall be available. It shall be communicated. It shall be available to relevant interested parties. Next is organisational roles, responsibilities and authorities. So how do you demonstrate that? It's really simple. You just have an organisational chart and job descriptions. Nice and simple. You've probably already got those in place, so that's that. Section 6, planning. So this is where you need to identify the risks and opportunities that your business faces. And how do you do this? Well, typically organisations will facilitate a SWOT, which is a Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities and Threats methodology. So we'll have a SWOT workshop and also a pestle. So that's looking at the external influencing factors. And typically this is political, economical, social, technological, environmental or ethical and legal. From that, you can then deduce where your main risks are and where your main opportunities are. And the standard then comes on to that later on. Because the next stage is looking at objectives. So how many businesses set objectives? Well, they might set objectives at a top level, but are they cascaded down throughout the organisation? Are there processes and mechanisms in order to be able to meet those objectives so that the organisation can enhance performance and move forward? Within 6.2, the standard covers the sorts of things that you should consider for putting those objectives in place. The quality objectives shall be consistent with a quality policy, be measurable, be relevant, be monitored, communicated and updated. And your company needs to be able to provide evidence on how it does this. So a simple objectives template with all of those kind of key areas is what is needed. 
So when planning on how to achieve your objectives, the organisation needs to determine what will be done, what resources are going to be required, who's going to be responsible, when are they going to be completed, and also something that's vitally important is how will the results be evaluated. So these are key requirements of the standard. And in our experience, when we go into an organisation that hasn't got 9001, quite often they might have a couple of objectives and it quite often is around turnover, but they don't have detailed smart objectives, which really does help the business to progress and get other people involved in helping to make sure that those objectives actually happen, that you achieve some real tangible results from it. 6.3, planning of changes. So this is the last requirement in the planning bit of the standard. And basically what this does is it helps you to take into account of any key changes that are going on within the organisation to make sure that you can adjust because no business stands still. So it's all about making sure that those changes are reviewed, looking at the risks associated with them and the implications of any changes that are taking place within the business. An example of this is a franchise group that we're currently working with. So they're expanding at a rapid pace, but that can have a knock-on impact to the support services, so the call centre, for example, that are supporting these franchises within the group. So all of those kind of changes need to be taken into consideration because otherwise the major implication is, is that the quality of service and the products reduce. The next clause within the standard is seven, support. So support covers your resources, your people, the infrastructure and the environment for which you work in and how you're going to monitor and measure that support facility. So this covers your people, buildings, equipment, hardware and software, everything that you need to function basically. And you need to be able to monitor and measure these resources to make sure that they are fit for purpose. So say for example with a building, you need to check that you've got adequate heating, lighting, basic hygiene facilities. Quite often that's outsourced through a facilities management company. That's absolutely fine. You just need to demonstrate how that happens. And that quite often can be through their records and reports. But you need to continue to monitor and measure the resources that you have available. Okay, and this goes without saying, you know, if you are expanding your services, you might need to take on more staff, but then you might need to make sure that they've got the right equipment and facilities in order to be able to do their job. A new addition to ISO 9001 is organisational knowledge. Now, this is an area that I think a lot of businesses overlook, unfortunately, but it has significant value in my opinion and quite often it's not managed properly. So organisational knowledge is the stuff that your business has gained from years of experience. It's the lessons learned from not just the successful projects and services that you deliver, but also the failures. I mean, let's face it, not every product or service or project is perfect, but if we don't capture those lessons learned, we're going to continue to make the same mistakes over and over again which of course results in potential financial losses and lost clients, and of course reputational damage. So rather than just firefighting and just continuing to make the same mistakes, it's absolutely vital that that organisational knowledge is captured. So how do you do that? Well, a lot of organisations capture it in various systems. It could be in CRM, so client relationship management systems. It can be in lessons learned logs, or it could be available on live systems like wikis, which are kind of like mini intranets or on SharePoint systems. And of course, having information in processes and checklists. So there are all sorts of things that you can put in place to demonstrate how you can share organisational knowledge within your organisation. And to make sure that that's used to your advantage rather than just being kept in an operations director's head or a managing director's head. Or there might be a key person that delivers a lot of your services. Well, that's great, but 
if that person goes, then that's a massive risk for your organisation. So you need to capture that organisational knowledge. So just looking at the kind of the human element of support and resources, there are three sections here that are really important, which is all about competency of employees, awareness and communication. So just to walk through those briefly then, on competence, you know, more often than not, this is something that you've already got in place. So you've got things like job descriptions to demonstrate competence, training records, skills matrices and things like that. And you can review that at personal development review meetings or appraisal meetings. Awareness. It's really important that you make employees aware of certain things like how they do their job. <laughs> and it sounds really basic, but a lot of this isn't provided in some organisations. So they need to be aware of key information. And also things like your quality policy, your quality objectives and basically information that will enable them to do a great job. And also communication. So this is one of my favourite aspects because the standard is so descriptive in this area. It covers what we will communicate, when, with whom, how and who communicates it. And you might think, oh God, where do I begin with meeting those requirements? Well, the simplest and easiest way is to create a communications plan of a communications matrix in order to be able to do that. If you'd like a free copy of a template of that, then just get in contact with us. Our contact details will be on the show notes on our website, which is www.blackmoresuk.com, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of that. Talking about documents, <laughs> this brings me nicely onto documented information. So in the past, this has been known as control of documents and records. So what is a document? Quite simply, a document is a form, a template. It's a document that you use as a point of reference within your company. A record is when a document has been completed. So if I give you an example, that would be a holiday request form. Okay, so the document is the form and the record is once it's been completed. So the standard does stipulate certain requirements around how you control that documented information. And I would just recommend to keeping it simple. I mean, and this can be an area that a lot of organisations find that after they've been through the process of implementing the standard, it makes their life so much easier. Because quite often for businesses that haven't got controls over their documents, it can be incredibly frustrating when they want to try and find a document but they can't. Or there's no clear label on a document, so they don't actually know what that document is. Or they might go to do a presentation and they find that there are 10 different company logos on the presentations and thinking, well, which one do I actually use? And this does waste an awful lot of time for employees. And quite often those mistakes that can be made from that can result in reputational damage as well. So sending out wrong information to a client... So the stand covers how you create and update documents and also how you control those records as well. So looking at protecting them, because obviously some of the records that you keep might have personal data on them. So you've got GDPR requirements that will affect the control of those records. Moving on to eight operations. So Ultimately, this section covers the nuts and bolts of what you do as a business. And this will be completely unique to your organisation. This is where you determine what your client's requirements are and that you have to provide the processes to deliver the products and services that you're basically saying that you're going to deliver. So it's entirely up to you how descriptive you are with these procedures. They could be simple flowcharts. They could be images. It's really varied. If you want some hits and tips on how to implement ISO 9001, by the way, we've got a podcast. Well, it's actually a podcast series that we recorded right back at the beginning, which is ISO show episodes 8, 9 and 10. So I'm not going to go into this area in too much detail because there are examples on how to implement ISO 9001 in that particular podcast series. But it covers things like, you know, reviewing the requirements of your products and services, changes, the design and development of products and services, 
And this is an area where there can potentially be exclusions from the standard, as I mentioned earlier on. One of the areas that I think is quite interesting now with ISO 9001 is the fact that there is a whole page dedicated to the control of externally provided processes, products and services. Why is that? Well, in our experience, many businesses now outsource a lot of the service deliverables or the support that they need in order to be able to deliver their services. A typical example here is an organisation that might not have an IT department. That's completely outsourced, which is fine. But obviously there is a risk there, because what if you can't access your data? So you just need to consider who you're using within your supply chain and how do you potentially control the delivery of the services and products that they're providing you in order to be able to deliver your services. So the standard covers things like the evaluation of those suppliers, the selection, monitoring, and also the performance management of those key suppliers. So just go into quite a bit of detail to provide you with guidance and support on doing that. And the standard does cover things like identification and traceability, looking at property belonging to customers. And property, a lot of people think of this as the tangible property, but actually it's the intangible assets as well that you have access to and that you have a responsibility to look after, like personal data. It could be credit card information. Okay, so how do you protect those assets as well? So it's not just your own commercial assets, it's your client's assets as well. So it does cover step by step those key requirements for delivering your services. Section 9 is performance evaluation. It goes without saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage or improve it. So again, this is an area that we find that there's a lot of gaps within companies. Then they're very good at getting on with the day job, but not necessarily monitoring and measuring the effectiveness of that and how they could potentially make improvements, how they could reduce costs, how they could improve performance. Okay, so this is an interesting area that we always find helps to reduce costs and improve service and products. Now, one of the mandatory areas within performance evaluation is internal audits. So this is where the standard says the organisation shall conduct internal audits. And usually this isn't done within most businesses. And that might be because it's viewed as a tick box exercise. But again, this is where I want to bust one of those myths. <laughs> we need to dispel that myth from the outset because in theory, this should be all about evaluating performance. Okay, and the key requirements here is that you have an audit schedule, so you plan what you're auditing and you complete those audits. Now, because this is new to a lot of businesses, don't worry, we provide internal audit training. We have an e-learning course that's available and a two-day in-house training course. If you're looking at more advanced training, that is available through certification bodies and that would be a lead auditor training course. So there's lots of help out there if you are looking at doing your own internal audits. And the final stage of performance evaluation is management review. And ISO 9001 makes this process really easy by stipulating predefined criteria for what your business needs to review. And it's as it says on the can, <laughs> literally with management review, it does take you through step by step everything you need to review. I'm not going to list all of them, but it covers things like customer satisfaction, monitoring and measurement results, audit results, supplier performance, etc. Okay, so it's really important that you do review that. Historically, some organisations might have done this once a year in one big management review meeting, but more often than not, these key reviews are actually embedded within other operational meetings and senior leadership team meetings throughout the year. So it means that you can be more dynamic in reviewing performance within the company. Okay, saving the best to last, clause 10, improvement. This, I think, is probably one of my personal favourites as far as 9001 is concerned, because this is 
what it's all about at the end of the day. It's about continually improving your business. And again, this is where, for a business that hasn't got 9,001 in place, this is where we find the biggest gap. Because businesses are not capturing those mistakes that are made, the errors. Those things actually cost the business money. These are the areas that mean that your clients are unhappy. And this is kind of the easiest way to be able to identify the cost of poor quality. So an example of that could be write-offs that you're having within an organisation. Just because you think that, oh, we'll write that off as a gesture of goodwill. Well, what's the root cause of that? What was the cause of that issue? Because unless you determine that, you're just going to keep making those same mistakes again. So this area is called non-conformity and corrective action. So this is where you need to be able to have a simple and easy method for everybody within the company to be able to capture when things go wrong. So it's not just a customer complaint. It's not about being reactive when a customer complains. It's about identifying opportunities for improvement within your business on a day-to-day basis. Because if you can capture that, you can look at the root cause, you can then prevent those issues from reoccurring, and you're always looking at improving your way of working. So that's it. It's been a very brief overview of the standard itself. Further information is available on the ISO show episodes 8 to 10 on the ISO 9001 Steps to Success. And also, if you want further information on some of those clauses, the e-learning course is available. It's only £50 and it is available on our website, www.blackmoresuk.com. And if you're interested in further information on specific clauses within the standard, we are going to be covering those in future episodes of the ISO show. So I hope that's been helpful. And we will be covering an insight into other standards as well in future ISO shows. So if there are any in particular that you would like an overview of, then please do get in touch with us and give us your feedback. We really do appreciate it. So that's all from me. I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to use ISO?